Too many people are afraid of tomorrow. Their happiness is poisoned by a phantom. Many are afraid of old age, forgetting that even if they should lose their bodily vigor, weakness itself may minister to the development of the mind and spirit. Instead of chagrin over the past and alarm over the future, suppose we consider our opportunity. As Emerson put it, write in on your heart that every day is the best day in the year. No man has earned anything rightly until he knows that every day is doomsday. Today is a king in disguise. A small lesson from three great minds, Stevenson, Phelps, and Emerson. Courage and intelligence are the two qualities best worth our cultivation, and don't play it too safe. The man who has least fear for his own carcass has most time to consider others. One of the most interesting things about people is that they can and do change for the better. A person who was once a criminal becomes a model citizen. Another person kicks a drug habit and begins living a life of responsibility and contribution. And for every one of those, there are millions who, over a span of years, have become substantially better as persons, who are kinder, more honest, more conscientious about their responsibilities, and so on. But just how does a person improve, and why? In his column, Strictly Personal, Sidney J. Harris once wrote, it is not an act of intellect that makes people change themselves for the better, not a matter of insight, but an act of the will. For intelligence without courage is as static as courage without intelligence is rash. It is not an act of intellect that makes people change themselves for the better, but an act of the will. For intelligence without courage is as static as courage without intelligence is rash. It is intelligence with courage that results in the necessary act of the will we need in order to bring about constructive change in ourselves. The person who breaks a bad and destructive habit does so by an act of the will. His intelligence tells him that he has a bad habit. It may be a work habit. It may be a study habit or non-study habit. It might be a drug habit. It can be any sort of non-productive or destructive habit. Any person with a bad habit knows about it. His intelligence informs him. But changing a bad habit into a good one, or at least getting rid of the bad one, takes an act of the will over a sufficiently long period of time to render it impotent. After a period of time, a surprisingly short time for most habits, it no longer clamors for attention. It fades away and finally disappears. Now the will can be turned off. The habit is gone. But it's turning on the will to undertake such a task that takes courage. Pericles said, The secret of happiness is freedom, and the secret of freedom, courage. When we rid ourselves of unproductive and debilitating habits, we literally free ourselves to that degree. The more bad habits we can get rid of, the freer we become, the happier we become, the better our self-image becomes. The secret of happiness is freedom. But the secret of freedom, courage, for intelligence without courage, as Sid Harris wrote, is as static as courage without intelligence is rash. Habits that make us happy we should keep. Habits that lead to unhappiness and illness we should try to muster the courage to end. It's surprising how easily a bad habit is routed once it's faced with courage. As Emerson said, what a new face courage puts on everything. Anyway, I think that's how people bring about constructive change in themselves and their lives. They do it through courage, based on intelligence, resulting in an act of will. Victor Frankl, a distinguished psychiatrist and survivor of unspeakable atrocities at the hands of the Nazis in one of their concentration camps, says the last of the human freedoms is to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances. In fact, it was learning this that kept him free and alive even while he was languishing in a death camp. Let me give you that one again. It's so important. The last of the human freedoms is to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances. Attitude, being an inner thing, can keep us free, even fairly cheerful, regardless of the environment in which circumstances may have placed us. The ancient philosophers had discovered this fact, but it seems that each maturing person must rediscover it for himself if he's to find his own brand of freedom. 
Uh, Dr. Frankel also wrote, fear makes come true that which one is afraid of. Now, even if it only comes true in the imagination, we must experience the tortures of that which we fear, tortures often as not worse than those if what we feared actually came to pass physically in our lives. It's why the old line, a coward dies a thousand deaths, a brave man dies but once, is really true. Fear makes come true that which one is afraid of. If fear of something is held long enough, it may well bring on that which we fear. But it really doesn't make much difference because experiencing the fear is the same thing. That is, as far as our mind and body are concerned, it's actually happening over and over again, doing its inevitable damage to our physical bodies. Ralph Waldo Emerson said, fear is ignorance. Whenever we're afraid of something, I don't mean the perfectly natural, normal fears that work to keep us alive, but the gnawing, unreasoning, illogical, and neurotic fear of something. It's only because we don't know the real truth about it. If we did, the fear would vanish. That would include a neurotic fear of death, the fear that we are not liked or loved, and so forth. I think the thing to remember here is that when we fear something, it takes its toll on our mind and body just as if that which we fear had in fact come to pass. And we can bring to pass that which we fear, as Dr. Frankel said. But how does a person change an attitude of fear? Well, Dr. William Glasser, whom I'm very honored to number among my good friends, Dr. William Glasser, the distinguished psychiatrist and author of Reality Therapy and Schools Without Failure, says, if you want to change attitudes, start with a change in behavior. In other words, begin to act the part, as well as you can, of the person you would rather be, the person you most want to become. Gradually, the old fearful person will fade away. Dr. Frankel learned that by controlling his attitude, the concentration camp fell away. His mind was free to roam where he wanted it to roam. Think about what he wanted it to think about. It was as free as the birds, freer, really, for it could fly to the ends of the earth, to the ends of imagination in an instant. And so can yours. And so can mine. The last of the human freedoms is to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances. We can let circumstances rule us, or we can take charge and rule our lives from within. Just as I was boarding my plane in Sydney, Australia to return to the United States, my old friend Roly Leopold of Melbourne handed me a small booklet. He said, I think you'll enjoy reading this on the flight home. The title of the little book was The Gift of Courage, written by Paul Spiker. Let me read a part to you. If you could have as a gift your dearest wish fulfilled, the wish that lies closest to your heart, the thing that you want most in the world, what would you choose? A million dollars? Abounding health? A magic solution to business worries? A contented mind? A devoted family? The privilege of traveling only on the hilltops in the morning sun? Escape from the ills of life which are common to all? What gift would be more worthy of you than the fulfillment of an idle daydream? What one thing would help you win through the problems you face today and may face again tomorrow? What gift would enable you to enjoy because you've fought, to rest because you've labored, to reap because you've sown? There is such a gift within your grasp, a gift which you yourself can give yourself. A gift which will bring all the things for which you secretly long. A gift which, like magic, will help clear the troubled roadway ahead and set your feet upon the pathway to real happiness. And that is the gift of courage. Emerson wrote, What a new face courage puts on everything, and no truer statement was ever written. Wherever it appears, courage changes things for the better. Sometimes it's the courage to be silent when a word or phrase leaps to our mind. It's often the courage to get up on a cold, miserable morning when it's the last thing in the world you want to do, to go to work. It's the courage to do what needs to be done when it should be done. It's the courage to discharge a person who should be discharged, and who will probably be better off because of it. And it's the courage to follow the silent voice within you when it means going against the crowd, or speaking out when you know what you're going to say will be unpopular with your listeners. It's the courage to stay with something long enough to succeed at it, realizing that it usually takes two, three, or four times as long to succeed as you first thought or hoped. There's such a gift within your grasp, 
a gift which, like magic, will help clear the troubled roadway ahead and set your feet upon the pathway to real happiness. And that is the gift of courage. Do you know what form of punishment people dread more than any other? I'll bet you'd never guess. Well, it's laughter. That's right. As a wise man once wrote, the deepest principle of human nature is the craving to be appreciated. And the exact opposite of being appreciated is to be laughed at. In fact, among the Eskimos, laughter is the only punishment for thieves. If a person is found to be a thief, all the Eskimos in the village laugh at him whenever they see him. As a result, there's very little stealing among Eskimos. This is the reason youngsters in school like to dress alike. I drove by a corner the other day where four or five girls who looked to be of high school age were waiting for a school bus. They were all wearing identical coats. It appeared at first that they belonged to some kind of an organization which demanded that its members wear uniforms. Even though dressing like everyone else has the effect of removing our individuality and causing us to disappear by blending in with the crowd, it's much better than taking the risk of being laughed at. And since children will laugh more quickly as at an individual who's different than adults will, children are much more conscious of wearing what all the other kids are wearing. Laughter is the severest form of criticism, and the fear of criticism keeps us from doing a lot of things. It keeps us from doing a lot of things we should not do, and that's good, as laughter keeps Eskimos from stealing. But it also keeps us from doing a lot of things that we would be better off doing. It is one of the enormous pressures of environment. Take the worker, for example, who avoids doing an outstanding and conscientious job because of the fear that his more cynical associates might laugh at him. Now here, the fear of criticism in the form of laughter could shape a man's life and keep him from the goals and achievements he might otherwise reach if he weren't so conscious of how his actions will look to others. It is here that a better understanding of what is right and wrong can overcome a person's fear of criticism. Frequently, being right and doing what is right can bring down upon us criticism and derision while going along with things, even though we know they're wrong, will keep us in good with the crowd and our associates. Now, it's right here that the men are separated from the boys. When our desire to belong to our crowd is more important to us than to stand up for what we know to be right, we have to admit that we are lacking in the two most important attributes of a human being, courage and maturity. Winston Churchill once said that Courage is the finest quality because it guarantees all the others. And if there's one vital aspect of living successfully that we should get across to our youngsters, it's this. If our kids want to dress like all the other kids in their class, fine, that's normal. We were the same way when we were kids. But they should be told why they want to look like all the other kids in school, that it's their natural desire to belong, to be liked. And while that's perfectly all right, they should keep constantly in mind that it should end there, and that it's also right that we should want to grow into individuals with individual goals, individual thinking, individual action, and that we'll be happiest if we will do our work as best we possibly can, even though it may be the fashion for most of the rest to slide along as easily as possible. F.D. Huntington wrote, Conduct is the great profession. Behavior is the perpetual revealing of us. What a man does tells us what he is. Here's a question for you. If you came across a plank on the ground, say the plank is 12 feet long, 4 inches thick, and 12 inches wide, you'd have no trouble walking from one end of it to the other. Now let's stretch that same plank between two buildings that are 100 feet tall, with nothing under you except 100 feet of air and a street down below, would you walk the same plank now? Same plank, same distance, but a different, more demanding situation. And let's say you're telling your family, gathered around the dinner table, about something in which you believe very much, your philosophy of living, for example. Now change the setting to an auditorium. You're standing on the stage before a thousand people. How would you feel about making the talk now? You'd be saying the same thing in the same way, but the setting has changed. Walking the plank and making the talk are easy for you in one set of circumstances without changing your performance at all, but changing the setting, a new element is introduced, one that alters your mental attitude considerably, and that element is fear, fear of what might happen. Fear of what might happen under this new set of circumstances turns two perfectly simple and natural performances into occasions of great risk, so great that you might refuse to do either of them. Since you know perfectly well that you can walk the plank if it's on the ground, 
It stands to reason you can walk the same plank anywhere else. If you can make a talk under one set of circumstances, you can make the same talk, and just as interesting, under any other conditions. But fear seems to keep us from taking a formula we know will work under one condition and applying it to a larger situation. The fear of what might happen holds us back. We permit ourselves to fail by default rather than run the risk of failing as a result of having made the effort to succeed. Now, it's not important that we walk the length of the plank, whether it's on the ground or high in the air. And it's not too important whether we make our little talk to the people in the auditorium, perhaps. But how many things are there at which we succeed, at which we could be successful on a much larger scale? It's all a mental game. We play the whole thing out in our minds, and it's there, not in actual practice, that we win or lose. No one can even guess how much is lost by the so-called average person, simply because he fears to make the attempt. His fear of failure in his own eyes and in the eyes of his family and friends and the possible loss of a small stake, raises a formidable wall between his reality and his dream. So he contents himself to peek at his dream over the top of the wall and wait. Wait until conditions are better, or Uncle Charlie dies and leaves all that money. But waiting just seems to make the wall grow higher. Conditions seem to remain about the same, and Uncle Charlie's going to outlive everybody in the family. And finally, even on tiptoes, you can't see over the wall anymore. It's too high now, and it's too late. Well, so what? It was just an idea, a dream. Yes, that's all it was, just an idea, a dream, but what could it have been? What might it have been if you'd scrambled over that wall before it got too high? You remember when Robert N. Manry, a copy editor at the Cleveland Plain Dealer, sailed from the United States to England in a 13 and a half foot sailboat? 3,200 miles across the North Atlantic in a boat so small you'd hesitate to take it out on Lake Michigan or Long Island Sound as small craft warnings were flying. For 78 days, Manry and his tiny 36-year-old sailboat battled one of the toughest stretches of salt water on Earth. Gales blew the boat on its side. Manry tried to nap during the day and sailed at night so that he could try to avoid being run down and chopped into kindling and hamburger by great ocean-going steamers. On several occasions, he was washed over the side in heavy seas, and each time he'd haul himself back aboard by a lifeline he kept tied about himself and to his boat. He suffered terrible hallucinations, the result of having to take so many pep pills to stay awake during the long nights. Why? What made him do it? It wasn't publicity. He went about the whole thing so quietly, practically no one even knew what he was up to. He thought no one would pay any attention to him, and that was fine with him. The reason was that he had dreamed of sailing the Atlantic ever since he had been a small boy. He bought the dinky old boat for $250. He completely rebuilt it, taught himself navigation, and practiced long-distance sailing on Lake Erie. He told his wife the real reason for his embarking on so incredible a journey and so vulnerable a craft. He said to her, there's a time when one must decide either to risk everything to fulfill one's dreams or sit for the rest of one's life in the backyard. That's why Mr. Manley went sailing over the mountains of deep water in a boat only about twice the size of your bathtub. That's why he sat in his tiny open cockpit and weathered storms that caused the passengers to clear the weather decks of great ocean liners. He was fulfilling a dream he'd carried in his heart since he'd been a small boy. Well, offers for books and magazine articles poured in on him. Cleveland gave him a hero's welcome, as did the 20,000 people who wildly cheered the successful end of his voyage when he arrived in Falmouth, England. It's been proposed to Congress that Manry's boat, Tinkerbell, be placed in the Smithsonian Institution alongside Charles Lindbergh's plane, The Spirit of St. Louis. Courage. The courage to finally take one's life in one's own hands and go after the big dream has a way of making dreams come true. It seems to open hidden doorways from which good things begin to point the way. It's never easy, and the good results come only after we've made the journey in our own way. For Manry, at 47 years of age, it was sailing 3,000 miles to the North Atlantic. Each of us must make his own voyage to fulfillment in his own way. Or sit in the backyard. One of the nicest and most talented people this country ever produced was James Thurber. His writings and cartoons interested and delighted an entire generation, and they'll continue to live in the years ahead. 
I had the interesting experience of listening to an interview that had been taped some years before James Thurber died, and for the first time, discovered why he was blind. When asked about his blindness, he said that he had been shot in the eye with an arrow in 1902 when he was just eight years old. The other eye, to his and everyone else's dismay, slowly developed sympathetic ophthalmia and gradually went blind also. The amazing thing about it was that for many years James Thurber continued to see with one eye, even though the best eye doctors in the country told him he was completely blind. He didn't know how he could do this, and when asked, he could only reply that he didn't know how he could see, but he could. He also said that if the eye in which he had been shot had received prompt and professional attention, it could have been saved, and along with it, his vision for life. James Thurber never permitted his handicap to bother him or anyone else. He was cheerful, talented, and hardworking, and he had many thousands of friends. James Thurber was born in Columbus, Ohio in 1894. He became the managing editor of the New Yorker magazine, to which he contributed so many of his humorous articles and cartoons. He was a gifted and highly skilled writer, and permitted nothing to appear in print that he had not first edited and re-edited until it was as good as he could make it. He was probably best known to the general public for his character, Walter Mitty, the shy, wife-dominated common man who found release from his humdrum existence in fanciful daydreams of performing heroic acts. In his imaginings, he was the captain of a speeding hydroplane, getting passengers through the storm, or a highly skilled surgeon saving the life everyone else had given up for lost. This particular story got wide circulation and was made into a motion picture. The next time you visit your library or bookstore, ask for something by James Thurber. It's fine writing, and it'll make you laugh. If you still haven't read his story, The Secret Life of Walter Mitty, do so by all means. It'll make you laugh at yourself, which is the healthiest kind of laughter. And it was written by a great person who saw humor and interest in almost everything, even though he was blind. James Thurber. Colton wrote... Times of general calamity and confusion have ever been productive of the greatest minds. The purest ore is produced from the hottest furnace, and the brightest thunderbolt is elicited from the darkest storms. Here's a line worth remembering. It was written by Balzac. By resorting to self-resignation, the unfortunate consummate their misfortune. There's a world of truth and a world of unnecessary suffering in that statement. The only thing that can keep misfortune hanging around is self-resignation, giving up. Makes you wonder how many thousands, perhaps millions, of fine people stay on the bottom of the pile because they've formed the habit of saying, well, that's the way things are, or that's the way the old ball bounces. Now, that would be all right for cows and pigs. They have to take life as it comes, but it's the very thing a person does not have to do. If things are going badly for him, he can change things and cause them to become good. If he isn't making enough money, he can find ways of earning more. If he doesn't like his neighborhood, he can move. If he doesn't like his job, he can quit. If he doesn't like being ignorant, he can get an education. He can, as a matter of fact, do anything he wants to do. But as a rule, he doesn't know this. So he shrugs his shoulders, gets a sad look on his face, stands still, does nothing, and says, well... That's the way it is. If everybody had said that from the very beginning, we'd still be running around without any clothes on, throwing rocks at each other. Let's go back to Balzac's little epigram. He said, By resorting to self-resignation, the unfortunate consummate their misfortune. In other words, by wallowing in self-resignation, the unfortunate cause a bad situation to get worse and stay there. Every human being on earth is going to suffer a setback from time to time. Setbacks are a part of life, as are fires, floods, tornadoes, hurricanes, and earthquakes. But fortunately, the human being is a builder and a rebuilder, and he rebuilds better than he builds. He doesn't sit in the aftermath of the storm and resign himself. He builds better next time, so the damage won't be as great or even hurt him at all. That's how skyscrapers evolved from mud huts. Outside of death and taxes, we don't have to resign ourselves to anything. And if the situation is bad, unfortunate or unpleasant, self-resignation, as Balzac pointed out, will only consummate the fact. 
To my mind, there are few people more to be pitied than the sires, resigners, and shoulder shruggers, those who would rather complain than think, who would rather bleat than take action, who would rather ask for help than help themselves. If you know people like that, it's a good idea to keep away from them, unless you're very strong. They'll infect you with their virus, splice you with their mud, and they're almost impossible to help. Like rag dolls, they'll flop right back down again the minute you turn loose of them. Just make sure you don't adopt any of their fatal habits. When things start to look bleak, remember that you have the power to change them, and that you're the only creature on Earth with that kind of power. Build better and stronger next time. Do something about it. Change a bad situation into a good one. Don't ask how. Figure it out for yourself. It's been written that it's often better to have a great deal of harm rather than a little happen to one. A great deal of harm may rouse you to remove what a little harm will only accustom you to endure. This is a story about what can happen to a loser. When he was a little boy, the other kids called him Sparky after a comic strip horse named Sparkplug. Sparky never did shake that nickname. School was all but impossible for Sparky. He failed every subject in the eighth grade. Every subject. He flunked physics in high school, received a flat zero for the course. He distinguished himself as the worst physics student in his school's history. He also flunked Latin and algebra and English. He didn't do much better in sports. Although he did manage to make the school's golf team, he promptly lost the only important match of the year. There was a consolation match, however, and Sparky lost that, too. Throughout his youth, Sparky was awkward socially. He was not actually disliked by the other youngsters. No one cared that much. He was astonished if a classmate ever said hello to him outside school hours. No way to tell how he might have done a dating. In high school, Sparky never once asked a girl out. He was too afraid of being turned down. Sparky was a loser. He, his classmates, everyone knew it. So he rolled with it. Sparky made up his mind early in life that if things were meant to work out, they would. Otherwise, he would content himself with what appeared to be his inevitable mediocrity. But there was one thing that was important to Sparky. Drawing. He was proud of his own artwork. Of course, no one else appreciated it. In his senior year of high school, he submitted some cartoons to the editors of his class yearbook. Almost predictably, they were rejected. Despite this particularly painful rejection, Sparky was so convinced of his artistic ability that he decided to become a professional artist. Upon graduating from high school, he wrote a letter to Walt Disney Studios. He was told to send some samples of his artwork, and the subject matter for a cartoon was suggested. Sparky drew the proposed cartoon. He spent a great deal of time on it and the other drawings. Finally, the reply from Disney Studios came. He was rejected once again. Another loss for the loser. So Sparky wrote his own autobiography in cartoons. He described his childhood self, the little boy loser, the chronic underachiever, in a cartoon character that was soon to become famous all over the world. For the boy who failed every subject in the eighth grade and whose work was rejected again and again was Sparky Charles Monroe Schultz. He created the Peanuts comic strip and the little cartoon boy whose kite would never fly, Charlie Brown. Winston Churchill said it all in a speech he once made during World War II. Never give up. Never give up. Never, never give up. William Ellery Channing wrote something a long time ago that I like. He called it Man's Will to Rise. It goes like this. You may see thousands with every opportunity of improvement which wealth can gather with teachers, libraries, and apparatus bringing nothing to pass, and others with few helps doing wonders, and simply because the latter are in earnest and the former not. A man in earnest finds means, or if he cannot find them, creates them. A vigorous purpose makes much out of little, breathes power into weak instruments, disarms difficulties, and even turns them into assistances. Every condition has means of progress, if we have spirit enough to use them. The truth that progress is the very end of our being must not be received as a tradition, but comprehended and felt as a reality. A man is to cultivate himself because he is a man. He's to start with the conviction that there's something greater within him than in the whole material creation. 
than in all the worlds which press on the eye and ear, and that inward improvements have a worth and dignity in themselves, quite distinct from the power they give our outward things. Undoubtedly a man is to labor to better his conditions, but first to better himself. Difficulties are meant to rouse, not discourage.